Hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience with us. Uh, I'm Emily Gray, Exec Director of Mercury Musical Developments, and I'm here with my colleague James um, to chair this discussion with our wonderful panel of freelancers who you are about to meet. Um, Hello, everybody. Thank you for your patience. I am uh, part time with MMD and the rest of my job is freelance. So um, at the beginning of this whole pandemic, uh, I shared that moment with many, many of you and possibly everybody on the panel where there was a moment where all that freelance work just disappeared. Um, and I think we can't have a discussion about freelancers without uh, acknowledging that it's been a really, really tough and challenging time. Um, but the panel we've gathered here today and also many of our members have been extraordinary in their resilience and their resourcefulness and uh, the way that people have come up with ways to work through this pandemic and support each other and get the voices of freelancers heard. Um, has to be commended and celebrated and shared. Um, and of course, there are many wonderful new projects that have come up. I've been working with artists in India in a way that would never have happened without uh, this crisis. So, um, but that's my very small part of this. Um, mainly we're here to uh, welcome uh, these, yeah, this wonderful panel of freelancers. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to James and then we will meet everyone. Thank you. Yes, welcome everyone. I'm James Hadley, Executive Director of Musical Theatre Network. Thanks for joining us. If you're watching this live, then you can type a question into the YouTube chat at any point during the discussion. Uh, please just say question in capital letters at the start and then type your question. Uh, Emily and I will be receiving those from our lovely colleagues, Martin and Ellen backstage. Uh, and then we'll be up putting those questions to our panelists in the last third of the discussion. But you can ask those questions at any point during the discussion. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for joining us. If you're watching this, um, once it's posted on YouTube, so it's not live, obviously you can't ask any questions at the time, but do feel free to get in touch with us if the conversation raises anything you want to ask about. Um, just go to the website for MMD or MTN and that has all our contact details on it. Um, so you can get in touch and we can signpost you to any useful resources. There's also some COVID-19 resources on both of those websites with a lot of the resources that are relevant to freelancers during the current situation. So thanks so much for joining us. And without further ado, we're going to introduce our wonderful panel. Um, first up, uh, I'd like uh, Jamie Chapman-Dixon to introduce himself, please. Hi, uh, thanks James and Emily. Um, I'm, well, my name is Jamie. Uh, I'm a freelance theatre producer. I currently hold the position of producer at the Barn Theatre. Um, I also own and launched the Theatre Producer Portal um, alongside John Webb Carter. Um, I'm also currently doing other freelance projects um, just to uh, keep myself sane through this weird and wonderful time. So I'm currently uh, co-producing the uh, Tonight at the London Coliseum string of concerts for Take Two and also producing other shows such as What a Carve Up, uh, Private Peaceful. I've got two other shows about to be announced and various others just to try and spread myself as much as possible um, during this, well, I don't know what to call it anymore, but um, yeah, I'm happy to talk or, or chat or have any questions about anything to do with production, producing, uh, working at a venue or freelancing at all. Thank you very much, Jamie. And now, uh, Rebecca Brewer. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca. I'm an actress and a theatre maker um, and a songwriter. And uh, in the spirit of freelance life, I also freelance tutor um, at different drama schools, which has all been online recently for obvious reasons. Um, I'm an associate artist at the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch as well. So I live out kind of like, I'm originally from Derby, but I live in the, in the east end of the district line. Um, I have been working on a show called Coven, which is a gig theatre show about witches. Um, we were, just about to we had an amazing offer for a wonderful Edinburgh venue which um, obviously then didn't go ahead for obvious reasons but we've gone back to the drawing board a little bit and we've managed to do a little bit of work on the show despite that um, and it also throughout lockdown got my first commission to make a documentary which is something that I never imagined that I would ever do so that's been a joy as well but thanks for having me nice to meet you all that's me. Thank you Rebecca and next member if you want to introduce yourself. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, my name is Mimba Dodwell. I am an actor and director. And probably, as um, Rebecca said, you end up doing lots of things as a freelancer. So I end up being a facilitator a lot, leading workshops. Um, and also I am part of the Diversity School Initiative, a company that I run with Stephen Kavuma and Mami Atua. And um, it is the company that goes into drama schools to assess and talk about the inclusivity and betterment of training um, for students so that's what I do and I also work for the National Youth Theatre as a freelance director and I was the point of the freelance task force um, sort of uh, a contact for them and person um, liaison for the National Youth Theatre so I was fortunate enough in the beginning of the pandemic to have that support and um, be part of a group of people who are trying to better and change the industry I think that was really great about being part of that it wasn't just for the pandemic it's like how can we change the industry and better it for freelancers going forward which I think is the way we need to be thinking um, and uh, I am also fortunate enough that a project that I was directing um, at a university I went to, Arts University Bournemouth, as directing a third year show, um, is still going ahead. We're just trying to change it. And it's just a bit bonkers doing some digital rehearsals and then doing some um, rehearsals, at so, like social distance rehearsals. So I am very scared about doing that, but I'm also like, oh, this could be interesting. How do we do this? And um, we're preparing a show for, for a digital audience. So... Um, yeah, that's what I'm up to. So. Lovely. Thanks, Mumba. Uh, and Ruth? Uh, hello. Uh, I'm a composer for uh, theatre and multimedia. Um, I started off uh, specialising mostly on film and television composition and moved into theatre about eight years ago. Um, I also am a musician, pianist, uh, a multi-instrumentalist, I call myself at times, but uh, I do all kinds of music. Um, yeah, um, at the moment, uh, well, previously I've worked for companies such as the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, Chichester Festival, Theatre, Traverse Theatre, all kinds of different theatres around the country. And obviously this year, um, all my shows uh, have got postponed from the lockdown um, but luckily they're postponed and not um, cancelled yet uh, so um, yeah so currently I'm still developing quite a few sort of different shows to keep um, going um, I've been doing some online work with um, on a project of uh, experimenting on um, digital sort of interactive version of Midsummer Night's Dream, which is hopefully coming out in a couple of months. And that is an interactive thing with um, uh, the audience choosing what sets and uh, lighting and music, what, what would they like to create their own show. So it's aimed mostly for sort of use for people who've never been to theatre as a way to get into this during pandemic. Um, I'm also um, been working on a BBC animation called The Prom Promise, uh, which is a five minute um, uh, film. So I've been sort of getting back into film and television again. And um, other things like uh, Hong Kong Arts Festival, which was supposed to happen this year um, in February but uh, COVID hit them a bit earlier than the rest of us. So uh, now that, that's been postponed to next year on a sort of a dance piece. And um, yeah, lots of things going on. <laughs> um, yeah, so next year I'm also doing uh, an outdoor fence called The Hatchling at Plymouth uh, to celebrate the four, 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Historic Voyage from um, Plymouth to Massachusetts, so that's going to be now looking like the 401st anniversary. <laughs> uh, and also at the same time, I'm developing lots of different sort of uh, my own personal projects, sort of uh, such as Follow the Light, which was supposed to be on Beam 2020 this year. Uh, obviously, that's been sort of postponed. Um, and yeah, sort of looking for fundraising. So I've been sort of multitasking a lot more as uh, a producer, fundraiser. Um, and also sort of uh, networking and looking for sort of partnerships, touring partnerships at the moment. I think that's it for now. Great, thank you. Um, Sharon. Hello, I'm Sharon. I'm a freelance stage manager, production manager. I also do some lecturing in drama schools. Again, that's been online. There's um, 
interesting teaching stage management online because we kind of rely on interacting with people. Um, I was coming out of maternity leave. Uh, my first gig was going to be coming up to Beam in March. So, yeah, <laughs> everything that well, I, I was booked up until September. Well, now and everything just evaporated. So I've amused myself by shielding my littlest one and doing the lighter in red campaigns to raise awareness and just kind of spread the word and now we've got involved with the we make events team so we're a unified voice and we've got more events more campaigns launching as we speak i think the next one next big day is going to be on the 30th of september so yeah that's what i've been up to great thank you and last by no means least show me Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shami. I'm an Irish theatre director based in London, but home in the hills at the moment. So I hope my Wi-Fi holds up. Um, I mainly, I suppose, have been assisting on different productions in the last year. I was on Come From Away in the Phoenix and uh, Jesus Christ Superstar at the Barbican last summer uh, and resident on Amour um, with Char uh, Hannah Chiswick and uh, Charing Cross. And I'm artistic director of IYMT, so it's Irish Youth Musical theatre. Uh, it was Colin Wilkinson and myself that set it up in January. Um, possibly bad timing one may say but also it has been a great project for us uh, to try and try and keep some tuition going and some opp performance opportunities. So that's kind of where I've been mainly uh, my headspace has been for the last few months. Um, and I've also directed Songs for a New World, uh, our virtual production of Lambert Jackson and LW. Um, over lockdown and we were very ex we were very excited last week to announce that we're bringing it to the Palladium for two shows in October so that's heading back to the the big smoke in, in a week's time so looking forward to that. Great thank you all so much um, and uh, we'd hope to have Dawn Farrow on the board as well she isn't able to join us but we did just want to mention uh, her company new company called Dogs and Coffee which it's really worth having a look at for freelancers but actually everybody it's very entertaining um, and it's particularly about looking at freelance work in the arts and um, great confidence tips and possibilities and just kind of really going for the future in a very positive way so yeah do have a look at Dogs and Coffee. But thank you, panel. So, James, do you want to start our questions? <laughs> yes, indeed. So uh, the title of today's discussion is Freelancers Resilient and Resourceful. And we know all freelancers in whatever area of the performing arts absolutely have to always be resilient to get by to keep the, the jobs coming through. And, and as Emily um, putting out earlier, it, it's so much more challenging than usual. Uh, and we could easily spend the 90 minutes we've got for our discussion talking about how difficult it is, but we thought that's not very useful. Everyone's already aware of that. So we want to try and focus on uh, those qualities of, of resilience and resourcefulness in terms of looking at how freelancers are managing to navigate their way through uh, a changed landscape. Um, so to begin that discussion uh, and acknowledging the challenges as a beginning point for the discussion, I wonder already in the introductions, our, our panelists have talked about um, some of the projects that have been uh, postponed or, or, or have changed prospects. Um, just to return to that and, and expand further on, uh, for you as individuals, um, how have your prospects as a freelancer this year shifted in terms of how are those projects adapting? Um, how much of a timeline is there if they're being postponed? Or tell us a little bit more about how some of those projects are adapting to be presented in different ways. For instance, if there uh, have been online sharings or outdoor stagings or things like that. So, so tell us a little bit more about what are some of the adaptations that you've made with you, within the projects that you're involved in, particularly any musical theater projects are of particular interest, but, but generally with your freelance commitments. Uh, who wants to start? Anyone <laughs> interested in going first? We start with Jamie. Tell us a little bit. I know you've been very active in lots of projects during lockdown. Yeah, sure. Um, so when COVID hit, uh, we had seven shows in pre-production and uh, in, literally instantly overnight. It was, so I was in auditions 
uh, on the 17th of March, I was in the finals for um, the Mozart question, which we were about to literally about to offer and make the phone call to offer to our cast. And that was a, that's a, supposed to be a beautiful new play with verse and beautiful music. It's a play with act musician, act musician play with no singing. Um, but uh, then the lockdown call came and that was obviously uh, uh, shunted and we lost quarter of a million, the barn lost quarter of a million pounds overnight. Um, just flushed, flushed away. Um, so those projects, so I'll talk about two things. So I'm, I'm technically a self-employed contractor, freelancer at the bar, um, and I have been for two and a half years because it allows me to be able to do all my other work as well. Um, so that those shows, so we had six shows in pre-production and even more planned. So we shelved them all instantly. None of those shows will be returning this year. Um, the earliest any of them will return is next year. Um, and some of them, we haven't 100% confirmed it yet, but some of them probably will never return. Just because of the fact that some of them, the, the goals and the ambitions we had for some of them, how we wanted them to be done moving forward, it's just not feasible, especially within the next 12 to 36 months. So they, we, we may see them in five, six years time. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, so instead we are we're about to announce luckily we're about to announce an indoor season um, so we're about to we just uh, announced private peace so we did an outdoor theatre festival called uh, Barn Fest for the last kind of eight weeks and we've just transferred one of them inside so we're opening our doors inside at last um, and that opens at the end of this week uh, we're in tech as we speak which is the most fantastic thing in the world to actually be uh, tech in a show inside a theatre space at last after six months it's just pure joy um, but uh, it has changed it completely because Private Peaceful is a, is a uh, basically a one hand slash two hand show because um, it's got one hand and a musician so it's it, compared to what we were doing uh, with 12 15 people it's it's com it's completely changed the game for us um, so we've done that and we are going to be announcing very shortly the rest of this year as well so we have got a, a full lineup now uh, programming until early 2021 um, outside of the barn I was looking at a lot of projects in terms of uh, uh, spaces in London and other things that we can get done. Um, but once again, they've all been shelved and none of them will return next year, unfortunately. So I've had to think about different ways that we can we can work on things. So the one good thing that I've seen come out of this uh, lockdown and during this time, because there's been so much negativity and there has been horrendous, but one positive has been the doors that have opened for everyone, um, that everyone, it seems, is now on a, on a um, level playing ground, that everyone's door is open, everyone's willing to help, everyone's willing to work together, everyone's willing to say, yes, how can we make this industry survive? Um, so one of those was, uh, obviously I'm co-producing uh, tonight at the London Coliseum. I did not expect to be producing a show at the London Coliseum this year, but it's obviously opened that door and we've been filmed, we filmed the, a bunch of concerts last um, uh, last month and they're being released weekly um, with Carrie Hope Fletcher, Sharon D. Clark and a, a huge list of phenomenal uh, talent and we'll be doing them weekly over the next kind of month, couple of months. So I think it's just trying to figure out how we can move everything online, but at the same time, in my personal opinion, we've been trying to think how can we, how can we turn things online but give them potential future life after this. So if what we don't want to do is put six months or a year and a lot of money into projects that are just online and then they cannot be recreated when um, uh, live theatre resumes because the last thing we want is a big lull of new content to be available because everyone's putting their resources and, and time into online only content. So everything I'm looking at at the moment has very much got the mindset of, okay, can we do it online? but can we revive it in a live version? So we actually found, so we did a show called Tweedy. Um, so Tweedy is a big kind of, uh, he's, a, he's a, a big name in the Cotswolds. He's a, 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 the clown of Gifford Circus. So uh, what we did is we did Tweed, Tweedy's Lost and Found um, over, uh, over lockdown during the kind of the whole, very much the, the first four months. We, we did just over 350 online different shows with various things. Um, but Tweedy's Lost and Found, we did it uh, once a week and it was this kids show, it was great. And then the second we could do work outside, we did a, uh, a month's run of Tweedy's Lost and Found. We did, we did him live and it instantly sold out. 
which was phenomenal just to see the fact that uh, we built that audience for him over that time period. And then when we got live, people were happy to come and see him live because you used that time to market your work, to build the reputation of that piece of work. And then you can flip it and, and uh, increase uh, that work for that individual, for that cast or for that team and continue it to that live area where everyone wants to be. No one, no one wants to be behind these screens forever. Like it's, it's, been great for not having to travel to meetings and being able to link up with people but it after, like, I, I want to be in a room with you all I don't want to be stuck behind a screen chatting to myself like in this room it, it, it's uh it's so we need to adapt and just keep thinking how we're going to move forward but uh, that's my main thing at the moment that's a brilliant example of, of just how adaptable people have. I think that's the thing, isn't it? I think human beings have realized that they are more adaptable than they gave themselves credit for. And, and let's face it, there's, there's no area that has needed more adaptation than the theater industry in all of this. Um, thank you so much for starting us off. Anyone else who wants to, to jump in there in terms of your own experiences? Mumba, do you want to? Yes, thank you. Um, I just thought I'd jump in because, yeah, I, I also had a bit of an un unusual experience of quick um, also adaptation. Um, so I was working in Manchester on a play called Rockets and Blue Lights at the Royal Exchange as an associate director for Miranda Cromwell. And um, and it was written by Winston Pinnock. And we were just about to go into our third preview. And then we get like the announcement, like we're about to do a warm up. And that was like kind of mortifying. Like It was weird because every day we were like, that week was a weird week anyway. We just thought, oh, we'll be fine. Like we can make it to press night. As long as we make it to press night, it's fine. Um, so we didn't have a press night like open to the public. Um, and we just had our own little sort of celebration press before we all headed back to our respective cities. Um, but literally within how long? I think it was in about three weeks. Um, somehow, wonderfully, someone had um, had gotten in touch with BBC radio or they had gotten in touch with Miranda that's it and so they did a lockdown festival so Rockets and Blue Lights was changed into a radio drama and so it was part of this lockdown festival with um, three other plays that were um, either on or planning to be on one at the Royal Court the Orange Tree and I think Stratford East and um and it was just really cool and be to be part of uh, the beginnings of Zoom, trying to work out the breakout rooms and recording and all the actors got sent microphones out. And I was lucky as an associate director, which doesn't usually happen, to be brought on to the production as well on when it went onto the the radio and just to support Miranda and those like though it's such a messy play as well there's there's 25 characters with 10 actors and trying to and BBC Radio probably has never done anything that size. Um, so that was a really great experience to be part of and that quick resilience and that quick change of this and just the innovation was amazing. Um, and uh, that was really great. And some of the stuff I've been doing with the National Youth Theatre has been done digitally. We, um, I, I was meant to be doing a summer course for two weeks with a friend of mine. We were meant to be leading it and sort of devising and coming up with stuff with the uh, junior members of the National Youth Theatre. But instead we end up doing a digital one week course and actually, it was surprising how well I felt connected to the young members and they got a lot out of it because they hadn't been doing anything. They're like, we've, they're like, they were just so happy to be doing theatre and playing around the Zoom. Like I, I really am someone who, this setting of Zoom is more unusual for me because I encourage them to like, I'm usually sitting on the floor with my like the laptop. I'm like dancing in the corner. We play games. I get them to like move the laptop around and play some tunes and just like break up the form of Zoom because I think that's really important, especially when they've been dealing with education. So that has been a really great thing to see that the National Youth Theatre has still kept the summer course going. It was actually invaluable rather than having nothing at all for a summer. Um, and so those members were able to engage. So I was really surprised by that. I think that sometimes actually offering a bit of something is better than, yeah, so again, nothing, I think nothing at all. I think we can, and also knowing that it's temporary is really like, I had to keep in mind, like it's not forever. Um, and so the more we embrace it and jar like play with the the form, the fun, we can have some fun with it. And yeah, so that's what I've been doing. <laughs> 
Thanks so much, Mubba. Uh, yeah, as you say, it's so great when we can uh, allow the, the the form to to interact with the content of what we're trying to do when it's digital as well. Um, so I ask, I'm just choosing someone now. Maybe uh, Rebecca, do you want to to share with us some of your experiences with 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 still continuing to develop Carbon or, or any of the other projects you're involved in? Yeah, so um, when everything closed down, I was midway through a run of the 39 steps at the New Vic in Stoke. Um, and so, like everybody else, we packed up and went home. Um, and it was during, I was sitting in my digs watching the press conference, the sort of infamous press conference now, which we all sort of remember quite well. And during the press conference, I got an email from the producers that I was working with to take Coven to Edinburgh, like forwarding this incredible slot. And I just looked at my phone and looked at the telly and just went, I'm gonna deal with that later because I've got a feeling that's not gonna happen. So, um, but in terms of acting, that was a fun thing. So just like packed up, came home, um, assumed that nothing would happen and my partner does a lot of voiceovers and he had a lot of work that needed to continue so he built a at home voiceover booth in our wardrobe with duvets and um, it's really good it works really well and so because I had an at home studio I got my first ever voiceover job which is just because someone needed someone with a um, an accent like mine and, and who had a home studio so I've managed to kind of make things work like that. There's been a few texts to my neighbours being like, don't worry if you overhear me screaming, I'm just pretending to be, you know, chased by aliens doing a voiceover. Um, and then in terms of writing, I guess one thing that often happens when I'm trying to create my own work is that there's always um, a slight worry in my head that something, that an acting job is going to come up. Um and uh, I guess, so I sometimes worry that I'm not going to have the, the time to really focus on the things that I'm developing myself. And that just went all out of the window for obvious reasons. I was like, okay, I can pretty much guess my agent is not going to call me in the next four months. What shall I make then? And so Coven, we were meant to be at Beam. We were meant to be at Edinburgh, like I said. Um, and so we, to be honest, the first thing we did is just take a little bit of time off to get our surroundings secure. I needed personally to make some money because I was just, I, I couldn't let myself do anything creative until I knew how I was going to pay my bills. And that is a real thing for so many of us. And so once I'd figured out some online tutoring, I was able to allow myself to think more creatively, but I had to get that sorted first. So that took a, a couple of months to kind of get that stability. Um, and then we, um, I got made an associate at Horn Church, which was, as, was amazing because that was not the case for me before lockdown. That was something that happened through, I think, that them having a bit more time to consider their organisation and the things that they wanted to do. Um, and so through that associateship, um, it meant that I've been given rehearsal space and things like that. And so we did a two week R&D in August. And obviously at the end of research and development of making a show, you normally show it to some people um, in a room. That normally happens. And uh, obviously that sort of was possible around August, but it wasn't really possible to the extent that we wanted to do it. And so we thought, well, let's make the most out of this. So we were able to share the piece with selected audiences and with sort of trusted um, colleagues, uh, but who were all around the country and actually all around the world. We have people watching in New York, we have people watching all over the place. And so that was an experience where I was like, this would never happen. None of these people would ever be in my R&D <laughs> normally because they're everywhere. So I just think there are times where we're going to want to keep some of this for the future. It's not all bad. And being able to share with so many different people in different places, I really found was, was really beneficial. So that was great. Um, and then we actually did Coven outside as well uh, as part of New Normal Festival. So that was that was um, great. And it was a challenge to kind of get that figured out. But one of the things we always say about the show is like, we're really flexible. We want to do it in multiple spaces. We want to be in theatres and graveyards and caves. We want to we'll do it in a car park, whatever. So to actually have that challenge given to us and to need to um, fulfill it was like, okay, we've said we'll do this thing and now we've got to figure out how to do it. So that was great. 
Um, and then the documentary that I made, that was literally a commission that came through COVID. There was a pot of money that was made available for people to either move existing projects into a digital format or to create new digital work. So I would never have got that commission if it wasn't for COVID. So I think it's just about trying to um, find the, the positives, I think, on the days where you're just like, because like everybody, there's been days where I've just gone, is this ever going to end? Is there going to be a sector for me to return to? Um, and can I make enough money from that sector to live, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just about what do we want to take from this time and this time of introspection that we've sort of been forced to have as a sector? What do we want to keep? And there are things that I feel like we do want to keep so that we can make sure that we come back stronger and better and more inclusive when we do come back it's not just the same old same old so yeah absolutely no I completely agree with all of that thank you Rebecca um maybe Ruth do you want to, to jump in now as another writer as a composer what have your experiences been only you were saying before some for instance uh how have you adapted since then yeah, it's been really odd. Uh, well, actually, obviously, I was about to do Beam when lockdown happened, uh, so that was really disappointing. <laughs> um, but I was also like about to do a workshop at the National Theatre uh, on their public acts musical um, project, which was supposed to be performed um, in August, and we were supposed to start rehearsals like pretty much like in a couple months um so that was really interesting because that lockdown happened about a week before the workshop um so obviously everyone just went home um but what was interesting is because we still needed to finalize what was the next stage of how we were moving on with this particular story which was um on brett's um caucasian chalk circle uh so we're doing sort of a mu musical sort of community musical version of this and um yeah and we had to record uh singers some singers remotely which was very very interesting because this was right in april where people just weren't really that prepared <laughs> shall we say but the the silver lining of that was we got some amazing music theater singers who are like western amazing singers that we probably couldn't have got them for the workshop due to their scheduling but suddenly they were all free so so we managed to get some great um recordings just from that and it was just like teaching them how to like record on the phone to try to work out what was the best way of a backing track on something that should have been on a piano but you know uh so we all had to sort of work on that um but that was really really interesting just to see how that like working remotely through sort of such a big institution, such a national, but also like on a musical, which I think is incredibly hard to do, but it, it was a challenge that we managed to get through. Um, yeah, and then the rest of it, I mean, the Hong Kong Arts Festival um, thing I was doing was obviously supposed to be in February, and then that got postponed to August. Um, and then because of what was going on in the UK, um suddenly they're like we don't want you coming over <laughs> so because so, we would have had to probably quarantine and then there was all this stuff where they got a second wave so they had to postpone it again um and now we're just looking at ways of how we could do this more remotely but luckily because i do work abroad okay well not abroad but from other countries um i'm used to working remotely so for me actually it hasn't been too different in that sense and most of the film and television work I do is done remotely I might have like two meetings with a director but I'll, I would like speak to producers and all these different people in production and never see their face so <laughs> so it's like for me what the biggest change was obviously all my theatre work got postponed so it's still there but in a much longer time scale which is great because then you've got the space to think about how you're doing things creatively and and reflect but obviously payment wise not so great because you only get part paid um so to make up for that i was doing a much more sort of film and online work and i'm lucky that i you know write in that field as well so um getting quite a few sort of online work just for websites and all kinds of things library music has been sort of really useful for me so 
still been bu fairly busy in comparison. So I know I'm quite lucky there. Um, yeah. So. Oh, that's fantastic. It's great to hear that it is that resourcefulness, isn't it, of having existing relationships to, to move around, to rebalance perhaps to a degree. Um, how about for, for Sharon, maybe, uh, obviously it's very different being in a, a technical or stage management role in terms of supporting productions. There's less ability to, to still go ahead with, with doing that side if it's online and so on. What's been your experience um, for some of the productions you had lined up for this year? Um, the the biggest thing that I've I've had to do is the risk assessments for all of this. Um, a lot of what I do is keeping people safe, keeping people alive. So the sh shows that I've gonna that I was gonna do have been coming to me and saying, "What can we do? Um, how can we make this work?" So working with them and saying, mm, "Yeah, you still can't do that," and going, "But." What we could do is like this so that that's been interesting working out how to do shows with social distancing rehearsing with um like for example regent's park so how do we keep the choreographer behind the screen you can't really but you can make a bigger gap between them and does the dsm get a screen and how do we work out who's going to be where when without a huge crossover and it's it's basically turned into logistics moving people around rather than logistics moving furniture around so that that's been a big part of what we've done but I mean right at the beginning when everything just evaporated there was no work at all for us in the industry. So a lot of stage management, production managers thought, well, what do we what do we know? We we do logistics. So a lot of the community based support and stuff has been sorted out by stage management. Um, things like distributing food boxes, um, making sure your neighbours have got prescriptions. So that's that's been really useful to use all of our skills but now we're coming back out of it basically our job is keeping keeping stuff moving but keeping people safe so so important isn't it i mean it feels like risk management has been a growth area hasn't it there's all sorts of risks that we'd never thought of and i yeah. sharon just to, to say sharon used to be our production coordinator on the first two beams and is the most stunning production management and her risk assessments are the absolute top i have to say <laughs> passing Thanks. on to shamey before handing back over to emily shamey how about you as a director and also as our, our one irish-based uh, panelist uh, tell us about what, what your experiences have been in terms of how your projects have adapted. Yeah, so I came back, uh, James, from London uh, on the 6th of March. I had to do a workshop in Galway, uh, but it was to launch our Breakfast on Pluto, which was to open here in Ireland during the summer and then go to Birmingham Rep and then to the Don Mar. So that was kind of, I was associate to Des Candy on it. Uh, so we were looking forward to that. We had our launch on, I think it was the Monday. And then in Ireland, it was the Thursday that things shut shop here. We, we shut up. Um, quite a little bit earlier than you guys. So it was, that was kind of my focus or my main kind of project for the year. I was also children's director or meant to be on uh, Secret Garden, which was uh, meant to go to the Palladium. Um, so they were kind of the main things, I suppose, out from an IYMT point of view. As I said, we just had set up uh, in January. So our first kind of project was our studio series where we're bringing different artists around different cities in Ireland to do um, workshops. Uh, so we had our first one in Galway with David Shannon, but unfortunately they all um, had to stop. Um, so really kind of everything that's happened since that has really been different. We hope that Pluto will go ahead next year uh, and our producers are great there and Anne's really working hard that that can still happen. Um, Secret Garden may still happen at the end of the year, uh, but it really kind of became a free calendar uh, like lots. So it is kind of just how can we fill that? And I think just 
like what Jamie and Rebecca were saying, you know, while it was such a bad and that difficult time, I suppose it certainly opened an awful lot of doors for me, a young director who's really kind of only two years in London. Um, and the Songs for a New World project that came up was certainly something that would have been probably 10 years off, you know, had this not happened. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and I really, you know, appreciate that, you know, it's, there's so many people out of work and so many people without projects like this. So I, we, I certainly don't take it for granted. So it was, it was a bizarre project directing. I'm here in my, uh, my home toy room with a little like stage uh, beside me. Uh, so it was bizarre to direct uh, Ramin and the two Rachels and Cedric from back where it all started in the toy room. But uh, so we did that virtually. And then um, we got word a few months ago that um that the Palladium thing may be a runner. So yes, yeah, so we're looking forward now to hopefully bringing back some, some live theater. Um, our, from an IYMT point of view, I suppose it was really an opportunity that we could for once offer more accessible training to at least initially uh, to young actors, unfortunately, like many things, um, you know, it's the cost that goes along with this. And I suppose IYMT very much kind of on par, similar to what NYMT do in the UK uh, and that cost that has to go along to, to make the production happen. Uh, so I think initially while things stopped, we tried, we, we had access like all of these projects to a lot of these artists and we, um, we did a festival and we did uh, some living room concerts uh, and we paired up with TRW, um, they, gave, they gave us access to their scripts, which was great. So we did some script readings. Uh, so yeah, so that was great. And it was just to kind of, even for me as a creative, you know, to be accessing new works every week. Um, and we did a full casting thing, uh, a full casting process. We had over 300 applications in from across the country. So that was good. So in one way, while we didn't get to meet all this new talent that we would have on our first production this summer, it was great to see what we have there. Uh, and it was great for us, you know, to know now going into hopefully when contact training can resume uh, what we have to work with. Great. Oh, thank you so much, all of you. It's, it's so interesting to hear about your individual um, projects. And we'd now like to go on to thinking more about um, sort of the wider term initiatives that are there for freelancers. So I'm thinking about things like um, the freelancer task force that members are part of, um, the freelancers make theatre work, and I'm sure there are many others. So it'd be lovely to hear about uh, initiatives that you know of or have been a part of that can be shared with um, others so I don't know if you would you be happy to set us off member about the um freelance task force can yes let people yes. know a bit more about it if they don't know and and your particular work within it yes um thank you because I was going to say there's them only two um so um uh freelance uh task force was set up um by um fuel uh, theatre it was a sort of open letter to the industry to be like as we head into this the unknown at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, how do we support the people who will not be on furlough? At that time, we didn't know the income support scheme was coming in and then it suddenly came in and we didn't know how much, it was just all a bit mad. So I think that was another way to offer freelancers the chance to stay um, in the industry. And so about 130 buildings, and I think it might be a bit more now, um, all opted in for three months to pay one day a week for a freelancer to work. And this was like, there was no, what was great about it, there was no commitment to the building in place. It's just a chance for a freelancer to kind of keep afloat to to make sure that one day is that if they are going to do another job and work in something else, that that one day is a chance to keep within the industry and have a breather. Um, and so um, I, the National Youth Theatre asked me to join in that because I knew the building as I was the Brian Forbes assistant director last year. So I got a bursary to train with them um, uh, as, a, as a young director and director show um, for about nine months. And, um, and so it was so what I've been doing with them is just attending the freelance task force meetings um, when, when possible, when I can dip in, but also feedbacking to the National Youth Theatre and things that they can do to help 
their associates and their freelancers um so we had a town hall with the associates and they brought up some things and there's some stuff that I was like I was speaking to their associate director at National Youth Theatre and an island being like maybe we can do this for um for freelancers so lots of people asking about funding and understanding how to freelancers applying for that and especially if you're not a director or writer that because I feel like also those funding applications are geared towards those those um those professions and I feel like we should be having more from composers from movement directors from um from different disciplines in encouraging those to apply for for funding so that's what the um freelance task force is about and what's really great that I've seen is that around around the UK people have broken up into their own sort of groups so then like in so certain areas will have their own port of call and they've just made a website so you can check out on there just different local groups because there's so many of us just trying to get all the disciplines together and my focus was on like emerging artists and um, emerging directors of young people because being at the National Youth Theatre and being a young director myself I was a bit like how do we as people who have just entered the industry keep ourselves connected I was fortunate enough to have connections like if 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 this pandemic had like happened like last year or like no like yeah probably like a year and a half ago I probably would not be doing I wouldn't have the opportunities as many people said now like I've been offered to give some um a lecture in a, at a drama school and I was like I would not <laughs> no one would be emailing me about that a year and a half ago so I think that um that some people are not fortunate in fortunately in that situation so I really I'm thinking about how do we create a space and place so that when things get rolling these people are offered the same opportunities and no one is left behind because they didn't have these connections and also um freelance uh, freelancers make theatre work is also an amazing organization um and they uh start off with a great campaign of like having some pictures up and saying what they're what they're what their discipline was and um and they they conducted a really good survey about freelancers and there was something like one in three were thinking about leaving the industry about in like maybe three months after the pandemic and um and there's really information really great information about the actually how many in like industry like buildings buildings have a huge um employ a lot of diverse people so those are the people and people from say working class backgrounds and those from different backgrounds and women and things like that because buildings who are supported by arts council who are who are um those are buildings who have a commitment to diversity and commitment to changing the industry if they don't have the funding then they don't have the people and then there's this people who disappear like um like I find it really stressful, like looking at the old Vic and seeing that zero percent, like zero percent of the senior management is of anyone of color, and like that's really stressful <laughs> because we need to support freelancers to keep them. We are the next people to be in like in the buildings and running the buildings because all those people who are running it were freelancers at one point. They didn't all just pop up. So, um, so uh, freelancers make theatre work is also a great website to check out how you can email your MP and make sure those conversations are happening um, in the with the right people. Also with that, I spoke at a cross-parliamentary um, group, theatre group about this. So I think that's also something I wouldn't have done <laughs> in current speaking to MPs about how we can support freelancers. And so it's been a bit bonkers as well. Like it's been, it's had its lows, oh dear, there's lows, but also some great highs. So I think that I'm really passionate about making sure that especially young people uh, realize how much how how much they are valued and needed in this industry. So yes, yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. And those are the people organizations. Great, thank you. Thanks, Rumba. Uh, anybody else? Nice. Thanks. Yeah, Becky. Yeah, I just want to give a shout out to the working class artist group that I'm a member of, which was founded by Scotty, performance artist Scotty and Bryony Kimmings. Um, so you can find the group on Twitter at WC Artist Group. So it's at WC Artist Group. Um, and the group shares a lot of um, opportunities and support and provocations to try to keep this only 16% of uh, the workforce that we have that are from a working class background. So we need to keep every single one of those people um, within the industry. So if you feel connected to that, have a little look on Twitter and also Common, do some coffee mornings as well. It was bi-weekly I think every Friday I'm not sure if they're still running but again just a um a way of having a conversation if you're someone from a working class background benefit class criminal class underclass and you want to have a conversation with people who um 
might understand your experiences in a different way because we all know that money is a thing right now it's the thing that we're not talking about within the arts it's always a dirty subject and it is it's it's being able to sustain ourselves which is going to mean that we're still here at the end of this so we need to have an open and frank conversation about money so check out working class artist group on twitter brilliant thank you it's great have we got any others any other thoughts sharon Hello, um, we've been, um, with my other hat on, I run backstage theatre jobs group with Phil and we had an event back in July, on the 6th of July, where we got all of the venues up and down the UK to light their venues in red and it started off by being the standby cue light and then a month later it evolved into red alert and now we're working with uh what are we called now um we called um we make events which is all of them all of the groups who've been campaigning rolled up together and the next event that we're doing is standards one now on the website we've got loads of information loads of templates um, so it's well worth going on there. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be tough going forwards, but if we've all got the right information of where the funding is, what we can apply for, then it should make it easier. So do go to the We Make Events website. There's a whole bunch of assets that we put up there this week. So that's definitely worth a look. Great, thank you. Thank you. We got anything else to add? Thank you. yes, Ruth. Um, yeah, so I went through. I think um, there's a website called housefeater.org.uk that gives um, one-to-one volunteer advice to uh, freelancers in the southeast region. Uh, a friend recommended that to consider, so I thought I'll, I'll give that one out. And uh, for composers. Um, the, uh, a film composer called Michael Price did uh, sort of weekly coffee morning sort of chats with other film composers or established film composers for about two months on a weekly basis and I know they also did mentoring schemes for people who want to look into films so I just thought I'd throw that one in as well and um, the young Fick, I think were doing some programs with uh, Jennifer Tang who's the associate director there at the moment um so it's worth checking those out because they're all like free online sort of forums and um you know master classes so i think they're very helpful if you want to sort of network or connect with other sort of artists in your discipline great thank you thank you we have oh sorry yes go and show me I'm not sure if there are any Irish listeners on board here, but I, I know there's quite a few regional theatres over here that are offering um, bursaries to freelancers just to use their space and use the theatre's facilities to develop work. Uh, we were in last week and it was just a joy to be back in a space. Uh, it was for a work that we were meant to open in Dublin in September. And again, maybe another blessing in disguise that we had this extra time to develop it further. But um, I know there are lots of different um, regional theatres. Um, it's not like a national scheme, but I know um, there are quite a list that are offering um, up to like 5,000 week bursaries, which is a great little um, development pocket fund to, uh, yeah, to bring something along. Thank you. I just, I know, I know we haven't probably completely come to the end of this part of the discussion, but I did want to just bring in one of our audience members' questions because it's so relevant to this moment, um, which is from Vicky Stone, who's asking about how people can become associates of theatre. So it's something that um, Becky mentioned earlier at Hornchurch and um, showed me that kind of thing of, you know, becoming associated with the theatre. Um, I don't know if Jamie, if that's some, something you might be able to talk to us about or if anybody else wanted to jump in with a, a a response to that how do you become an associate <laughs> yeah it, I, I guess it depends on the space and I'm sure everyone like Shane Rebecca I'm sure everyone's had a different experience of it um, I know our experience is more about send and it's gonna sound the most obvious thing in the world but just send us an email 
like literally reach out, get get in touch and let's talk. Like we're always happy to have a coffee with someone and have a discussion. And if there's something that you can offer us and we can offer you, then we're very happy to do so. A lot of the people who we've worked with over the last three years since opening um, have literally just sent us an email and been like, well, could do you, do you know, we, I've got this idea for a project or whatever, or this, or this season. So for instance, we're actually announce, about to announce a resident director um, for the next kind of three months, uh, like a, a, to get us out of lockdown. And um, that came out of an email. Literally, they, they emailed us and said, look, I've got this idea. I'd love to be involved. And we liked it. And I, I think people sometimes forget that buildings and theatres want to you as freelancers to be amazing. We want you to be great. We want you to, it's like when any director or any composer is sitting in a, uh, an audition room and you're, as an actor, performing to them, the director's there saying, look, please be amazing because you make my job a lot easier. Same with associate artists. If you come in with a great idea, fine, great, perfect. Um, but just, it, it's, I feel like a lot of people think those doors aren't open. So try it and I'm sure especially now where you've got a lot of people locked in their houses or or in, at their screens a lot more people are happy to reply a lot uh, a lot quicker mm. yes absolutely I'm sure that that makes sense getting in touch and I guess being clear what your offer is isn't it as a freelancer being able to say this is what I care about this is what I want to give and then that helps the the building or the company or whatever to yeah know what you're about good thank you is there anyone else wanting to add to any of those or James do you want to take over yeah, thank you, Emily. Uh, so, yes, and also to add that uh, members of MMD and MT, anyone listening, uh, we're still offering one to one advice sessions on Zoom. Uh, if you want to have a chat about uh, people to signpost you towards in the industry or just chatting about career development opportunities, they're still there. Uh, as with many other uh, Arts Council funded organisations, we're, we're trying to do what we can to, to give advice in those individual sessions. And the COVID-19 resources that are on both of our websites have lots of funding opportunities and other support uh, networks out there. So our next question for the panelists before we move on to questions from those listening. And if you are listening, do type in some questions into the, the live chat in YouTube and we'll be passing on those questions to the panelists in a moment. Um, but just to ask the panelists, what are your top tips for staying resilient as a freelancer. So it's been mentioned by several of you that you're relying upon contacts that you had developed prior to lockdown. Obviously we've all had to find new ways to network and to reach out and, and develop contacts. That might be part of your response in terms of how to continue to, to, to make contacts. But, but in general, what would your tips be for as a freelancer to, to stay resilient? Who would like to begin? I'll, I'll go if you, Thank if you, you. like. Um, so once again, it's, it's exactly that. It's um, it's reaching out and uh, and just having the uh, having the courage to kind of just talk, knock on people's doors. I, I'd, I'd say because I was, I'm only speaking for myself, but I bet anyone else on this panel, if anyone listening came and knocked on any of our doors, as in our virtual doors, I guess at the moment, um, we'd happily reply and have that conversation. Um, we so the whole point of the reason I started the producer portal was to open these doors and to get people who are starting in their careers to be it, whether you're a writer, or investor, a composer, a director, a, a producer, whatever you are. Um, and obviously we've got some phenomenal stuff from you guys of MTN and then MD and Beam on the site. But the whole point of that was to link um, people who are at the top of their career with people who are just starting out to be able to say, look, because I, did, I never came into this industry with contacts. I never came from a theatre background. I don't. I didn't know anyone, um, and it was incredibly hard just to just to break down that original barrier and that door. So it is. It's. It's. You. You'll be surprised that the amount of people within this industry who are nice, like people are lovely, and if you ask them for a favour, where wherever it is, Cameron McIntosh, or whether it is someone who's in the same graduating year as you, people will help. Like they, they, they will help and give you time. So it's just having the, the courage and the belief to say, look, I am going to apply for that role. I may be underqualified or I may be under this or I may not have self-confidence in myself or I, I might not fit the part uh, completely. But if you believe in yourself, then what the worst they can say is no. There's no gets thrown a lot around in this industry and it's not just performers who hear it a lot. It is creatives and production staff and everyone else involved. 
so people just need to have that confidence in themselves and other people will have that confidence in you as well thank you jamie over to sharon i think that we need to really reiterate that we're all in this together and the way that that we've been resilient as an industry so far into this pandemic has been by all pulling together exactly what Jamie was saying. Um, so let's let's carry on doing that. Let's be a united voice together. And I think rather than all going off on splinter groups and being like, oh, well, yeah, I'm not really brave enough. It's having the confidence to step up, be part of that. And of course, we'll welcome you, everybody. And the things that we've achieved, like the Light It in Red events, when we had everybody all along the South Bank, we had people pushing flight cases around Manchester. And that's all because we had an idea and we went to the industry and they all said, yeah, OK, let's give that a go. So, yeah, let's keep doing that. Let's keep holding each other up. Let's hold space for each other. And yeah and be brave ask for help if you need help ask for advice if you need advice i mean we're we're all here for each other that's that's what we do we come together and we make stuff better thank you sharon anyone else have any thoughts on resilience what are your top tips yes mumba um one thing i just wanted to say which i think um i always have to do to myself is be kind to yourself um, during this time it's really hard and you can feel especially as a young person I think that sometimes when you when you're starting out it can feel like you're not doing enough or like because you're not getting the results you need you're not doing enough um, so I would say like be kind do the like I'm a I'm one for lists I love a list I'll do a list and I'll tick it off and then I'll be like that's done for now I'm gonna hang out with my housemates I'm gonna eat some food I'm gonna chill have a life and then come back to the list like come back to another list the next day so I think that that's a really like giving yourself downtime giving space for all those emails and things to land and for those organizations to catch up um, is really really key because it gets yeah it's a lot thanks mumba over to shamey yeah i was just going to say the same thing as mumba there but uh, a very practical note i don't know about you guys but i really miss the commute i really miss that walk and that time where i normally think or i normally plan or i normally you know i'm, I'm thinking out however we're going to stage this or I, I, and it's not until the kind of the last six weeks, I've started to really, you know, go on long walks and to go and kind of find that commute. Although I'm staying in this house the whole time. I don't know. I just really miss that time to think. Mowing the lawn, it's such a great time to think, you know, very practical note, I know, but I don't know, it helps me. <laughs> no, no, that's great. It's a really good point. Uh, over to Rebecca. Yeah, totally. On that one, walking my dog has been an absolute, absolute godsend. It always is, but just having a little bit of time out. And I think when all of this first started and Spotlight were doing these amazing one-to-ones with casting directors and personally, me as a, uh, my acting side of things, I was like, I didn't have headspace for any of it. And I felt so guilty that I was not, so I should be trying to do this and trying to like meet these people that I've not met, but I couldn't do it because I needed to get my ship sorted first. And I think that's the thing is that if you if you need to um, take a break for two days, a week, whatever it is, a month, just give yourself time, hopefully. And I think it was safe to say now we'll sort of still be here if when you come back. So just take what you need and make sure that you do it. Um, social media is can be amazing. And with Coven, we got our outdoor gig. We got that through social media. Someone we'd sort of said on Twitter that we were like, hey, folks, we're up for this. Does anyone want, you know, two people to come and do this show outside? And so we got a gig out of it, which is amazing. So social media can really be a place where you can find opportunities at the moment, but also always the rule with it is just know when to stop if it starts making you feel like the rest of the world is doing all of this stuff and you're left behind just i'll try and try and say this to myself as well as you guys but just put your phone in a drawer for a bit because it can have that effect um and check out your local theaters and local theater companies in response to vicky's question about 
becoming an associate um, that opportunity came for me because I moved quite local to the Queen's Theatre and I wanted to get to know them. I'd never set foot in the place and I was like, this is my local gaff. I need to go in and have a look around. So this is before COVID, but I signed up to do a scratch night and literally stood on stage at the beginning. It was like, hi, everyone. This is a weird way to do this, but I want to make friends because I don't know anyone around here. So I really can like be my mate. And um, they I was lucky that they were really receptive and I know like New Perspectives in Nottingham, amazing theatre company, they have um, associates every year and they do like an online call out. So look at your local theatre and local theatre companies and see if you can get in touch with them and connect with them. Because particularly at the moment with any other, hopefully not, but any other future lockdowns that affects anyone's transport, I'm sure Jamie will reiterate as well, theatres need their local artists and local performers and people who can drive <laughs> there or walk there. Um, so yeah, but rest, number one is rest. Couldn't agree more. Far too often I find myself scrolling on Twitter at 1am and it's like, no, step away from the phone, but put it in a drawer is such a great tip. I know Ruth also has written a fantastic blog talking about meditative gardening and so on. Do you want to say anything about that, Ruth? Or? Oh, uh, yes, that was for the Genesis Foundation, because um, I got some funding from there uh, a while ago. Um, yeah, so I mean, for me, I, I was going to say exactly the same thing as everyone else, which is like, look after yourself mentally and physically. I was doing a lot of um, uh, long walks. I'm very blessed to be living in the countryside. I moved out of London a few years ago. Um, and that was really great to literally take a step back, which I don't usually get the time for and really think, OK, so what? what do I really want to do? Like literally not just like the fear to what it comes, but like, what do I personally want to do? Um, so that was really, really helpful. And I think doing that, I forced myself to do that every day because it was like, you can allow to go out once a day during the start of lockdown. So I made sure I went out at least once a day. And that was really great. It was just giving myself an hour a day just to do that, uh, to have a think. And it was the same meditation and uh, gardening, I found that going back into nature was actually really, really nice uh, way to rethink my creative thoughts, let's just say. So, uh, yeah. And I guess the other thing for me is being open about taking other opportunities or other ideas. So thinking things outside the comfort of your own sort of normal box. So for me, it was like... Um, re-looking at, you know, sort of how, if I wanted to do a new opera, how I could do a digital film opera. Um, uh, I, was, I was like, I've been meaning to write a concert piece. I haven't done it since I graduated years ago at Royal College of Music. Um, things, so just finding new things that I've been meaning to do that I haven't done because I've been too busy. Um, reading books, you know, learning drum notations, which I've never been very good at. Um, you know, reading sort of, um, uh, I was reading quite a lot of poetry to look for inspiration from um, old libretto for song cycles. And just, again, um, I know some people probably got fed of it, but I absolutely loved watching all the online shows that came up from the National, from the Mess Opera in the uh, States. Uh, and there was stuff that people, I think people didn't know, like from Asia, India, that were also really interesting theatres, like theatre that I wouldn't usually be able to see let's just say but because it was all sort of put on youtube it was really i, I just found it really inspirational so uh, i think for me that was the thing that sort of kept me going was just seeing why why i'm in this industry so and i, I think it's like it's the same as just going to see shows for research but like doing it just online and i thought that kept me that definitely kept me sane i think so Lovely. Thank you, all of you. Lovely tips. And just hoping that out of this, we can keep some of that self-kindness and some of the peace and the ability to think about things and just take take the pace a bit more quietly, um, calmly. Um, so going now to uh, questions that have come in, and we've got a couple for specific people. And one, um, Jamie, so you've got one of our writers asking if you could tell us a little bit more about how the producers portal works in terms of investors and uh, producers and writers and how I guess how it's going really it would just be really interesting to understand a bit more about the mechanics of it please. Yeah sure um, so the portal itself started in so it's originally started in 2014 called and it was called the theatre investment portal and I 
so basically I, I, I as a producer, uh, you half of your job is raising investment and finding those investors and trying to figure out where they come from. And the second you speak to a producer, majority of the time you say, what's the hardest uh, part of the job? And they'll say, raising the investment. Because it's very hard to, you can't talk up to anyone on the street and say, can I have some money, please? Um, especially for theatre, which is one of the uh, riskiest uh, riskiest investments you can kind of make, um, which is, you know, always, always helps. Um, so I, I took a job uh, as a producer at London Theatre Workshop, so I didn't need investors anymore. Um, so that was back in 2014. So I wanted to make sure these investors didn't leave the industry. I wanted to make sure that this money was still being put into theatre. So I set up this website where people could, uh, people I knew, at the, obviously at the beginning, could post um, on the secured network, could post the show, their show. So if you had a show run at the Suburb Playhouse for th- uh, three weeks and you needed £10,000, you'd post it on there. And you'd say uh, how much you needed um, and uh, how much the units were. So in, in breakdowns of if, if they're in units of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, et cetera. And a little bit about the show. It's running for this long, et cetera. And all it was was the people, the investors I had could then look at it and say, yes, I would like to invest. And then I'd link them together. Simple as that. Um, and I'd say, okay, Joe, meet Heather, there you go, have a chat. Um, and uh, there was no fee, I didn't charge for it, etc. It was all completely free. And I did that for five and a half years. Exactly that concept. So then when COVID hit, and it was literally only due to COVID, um, I, I've always, I've been wanting to kind of develop it for a while. So what we did is we transformed it into the theatre producer portal. Um, so what it basically now does, it helps anyone of any level produce shows. Um, so whether that means raising investment, investment is obviously on there. So we have uh, shows ranging from, so we, we helped raise for Devin Hansen on the West End to the Magic Mike World Tour, uh, but all the way down to um shows in the small house at the Southwark or at the Union or at the Finbra. So um, these shows range from a budget of £5,000 all the way up to £10 million. We did Pretty Woman on Broadway, Moulin Rouge on Broadway. Um, So it's it's a huge kind of variant. So that was one element. Then we thought, okay, so how can we, if we're getting people who are investing or producing shows on the Suffolk scale or the Union scale, but also got people producing shows on Broadway, how do we get these people to link? How do we get these people to help these people? So what we've done is uh, we've set up, there's probably about 40, 50 different elements to the website now, but some of the elements include mentorships um, with uh, people at the top of their game to the people at the start of their career. Um, We've got uh, obviously a new works library, which is basically obviously the MMD, MTN being involved in that. Uh, And what that is, is basically uh, writers who've um, produced work or written work but want it to get produced so they don't know where to um, uh, put it out there they're not represented by trw mti they're not represented by these people so they don't know how to get their work out there which is i think a, a missing point of our industry that there's so much phenomenal work out there but producers don't know where to find it um, they go to mti they, they go to the usual places that they know the license houses and if your work is not licensed you can't find it so you can put you put the um, work on the website and then our members, which is about 750 people now, um, will go on there, our producers will have a look on there and they'll go through it. Um, so obviously Mercury Music de- Development's on there, uh, Papa Tango's on there, Nick Hearn Books are on there. There's a lot of different initiatives. So if you've been through a certain scheme or a certain thing, um, you get on there. But also if you are a member, um, you can also submit your work via that way if you haven't gone through any kind of certified scheme. Um, then there's other things. So we've got a grant. So, um, so we obviously we we had to put a lot of money into recreating the new version of it because the website is now quite a bit of a beast to manage. Um, so we do now charge a membership fee if you are a member. Um, investors, once again, is completely free uh, to be an investor. You don't need to sign up and to put your work on there. It's that that element is free still. Um, but um, uh, one part of it is a grant. So 10% of all the fees, membership fees, goes towards a grant called the TPP grant, which each year we will give to a member uh, to support new writing. 
because uh, once again we believe that uh, money needs to be put back into the industry um, so you can just go on the website and just sign up um, for either an investment membership or it's called like a producer membership but that is also the writer's membership and the creator's membership um, we also have a thing called a one-stop shop so each month we rotate uh, uh, creators so if you're starting off your career and you don't know who to go to to book your tour to direct your show to compose your show to choreograph your show each each month um, we choose uh, a, a, a creative um, and it's free for the creative to be on there uh, for each month and they are our one-stop shop for that month so if you want to get a tour booker or a director and we try and give it to people who are starting off in their careers as well people who've done a few jobs but doing a, a still needed work um, but yeah there's a, there's a million things and there's breaking down barriers there's which is uh, linking people which is people have offered to do mentorships for free and workshops for free uh, we've got a webinar coming at our next one tomorrow is with david hutchinson who is the ceo of Celador, talking about all commercial theater then we have another webinar at the end of october with uh, morgan lloyd malcolm who wrote amelia um talking all things how to how to get to that stage how to get your new writing onto the West End stage. And then Katie Lipson's doing one this month. Um, so there's lots of different elements to it. And we're very much like a open door policy, we kind of call it in the sense of if you send us a message, you could, thing is you can text me, tweet me, Facebook me, whatever you want, I'll, I'll answer. Um, and we send it out to our, our people, our, our members every month to say, what do you want? Like, tell us what you want. It also includes resources. So if you are starting off and you don't know, you, you want to get a, um, uh, you want to contract a show, but you don't have any contracts or you don't know anything about contracts, we give you the contracts. We'll give you uh, draft contracts for everything. If you want to get your book published, we'll link you with a publisher. If you want to get a cast recording, we will introduce you to a cast recording uh, outfit. So it's more, it's just about being any gap that there is in this industry, we kind of want to fill. Um, so if anyone wants, if, if there's something specific people want, we'll, we'll do it for them. Um, because right. we have to help each other. Thank you, thank you. And it's plays as much as musical theatre, isn't it? It's a whole oh, mix, every yeah. sort of genre. So it's, it's plays, musicalog, shorts, poetry. We even got art exhibitions on there. We have immersive everything. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pleasure. James. Yes. Uh, so we've got a brief question here from Michael Kulo about uh, it's addressed to Ruth. Uh, Ruth, you mentioned uh, your support from the Genesis Foundation. So Michael's question is actually about the National Theatre's Genesis Music Theatre Group, uh, asking about whether that's still running or you know what if there's any further information about. It. I presume it's not. I, I sort of so I'm asking Ruth to respond to that, but also. Uh, any further comments about getting support from someone like the Genesis Foundation or other areas of support that, that people have experience of in terms of trust and foundations, I suppose? Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure whether that is still happening because obviously COVID um, and that had to stop short, obviously. Um, I know they were putting a funding out for some of the previous sort of actors and artists that were like participating in the workshops in the past few years, um, that they were giving some sort of emergency bursaries out. But I actually don't know if it's still happening or not. Uh, probably not from what I'm gathering, but because obviously a national, you know, uh, they're great scheme, but you know, they're big, big theater and uh, something like this has really hit them bad. Uh, because they've had to furlough, was it 90% of the staff? So, um, you know, even though there's like, I'm lucky that uh, the Caucasian short circuit is still going ahead, but, you know, just the last few months, the contact has been sort of very limited because the staff has been sort of on and off furloughed. So I don't really know is the answer <laughs> for that one. I can't help you there. Um, but yeah, it, it was a really great screen at the time. Just this, it was, um, I think they usually select their composers and writers and invite them in for people who've done sort of, um, you know, uh, with enough experience uh, on theatre writing. So uh, to consider music theatre, that was the part, that was the point of their programme. Um, yeah, and, and does anyone have any comments about sort of the wider experience of, of applying for funds during this time? There's been a lot of emergency funds around. There was a comment 
I can't remember who made it before about how maybe it was Mumba that that uh, so many applications are geared towards the uh, producer or the director, but but often you know in current circumstances there's been a lot of emergency funding that's available to all freelancers. Has anyone experienced applying for, for any of these? Uh, sort of funds or, or for projects during lockdown? Um, yes, uh, I haven't applied for any of the funding, but I know the PRSF, uh, the Performance Rights Society Foundation, did issue a few sort of uh, emergency bursary at the time. But I think I can't remember if they still they opened up their funding again for like Women Make Music and their sort of normal funds, open funds. But that one's definitely worth considering if you're in music. Yes, thanks, Ruth. Um, I was going to say I haven't, um, I've, I haven't had to apply for funding, but it was just interesting to talk to the associates and what they said about those different pots. And I think that there's just there's there's a few I can't remember the organisation, but I know on Twitter I've seen a lot more groups offering talks on how to apply for applications in Arts Council. Um, so there's always the social media people doing workshops and things like that on that. And also I would say like ask a theatre that you know like for the associate artists, could we have you guys have applied for funding? Could your development team do that for us? I think that's really important accessing those theatres and asking that um, for yeah for support in that because we don't usually do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Mumba. Yeah, I, you know, I used to work at the Arts Council. I'm just adding to that, that as Mumba was saying, it's so good to approach people who have applied before, either in theatre buildings or asking around. You'll always find there's people in your networks who have successfully applied before. And what we used to say at the Arts Council when I was there was, you know, absolutely get someone else to read an application. Uh, and you can get several people to read an application. So it's the first time through that system. It is a bit of a sort of formula for how to write a really good project fund application and the Arts Council that those project funding applications uh, they're one of the main sources of funding for creative projects at the moment uh, and I believe it's still the case that they've reduced the need for funding from other sources which can be one of the main restrictions if you haven't done many projects before and you're not sure where to get off the starter block in terms of persuading a venue to commit to a certain level of partner support at the moment some of those restrictions around the level of funding from other sources you need to have are taken away so it's more accessible than it's ever been and please, as all of our panelists are saying, do just reach out and talk to people, ask for advice, because that's how you'll get to write an amazing application. It is a lot more accessible than you think. A lot of it is just taking it step by step and working your way through the form little bit by little bit. Uh, it's all online on the Arts Council's website. And similarly with the PRS Foundation, that's the, the second most frequent source of funding that we hear about, certainly for musical theatre projects. Um, anything people want to say in terms of uh, the sort of silver linings that you're experiencing? We haven't got much time left, but, but some of the other opportunities that you're finding, either for um, new kinds of employment opportunities as a freelancer, or indeed in terms of different approaches to the kind of creative work you might take on that are happening because of being in lockdown or, or because of needing to take work outdoors. I would... I would say that um, uh, technology, I, um, just just in the terms of, uh, this could be an unpopular opinion, but I, f I feel like there's certain elements of the industry that needed a shake up in, in terms of how we how we do produce work and how we do create work. Um, so technology has been at our fingertips for so long, um, but it's only been in the last couple of years that projection design and projection mapping and, and using tech within our shows has been around but we could do we could have done this zoom we could have done a, a similar format to this years ago and the amount of time you waste kind of dry especially living in the Cotswolds the amount of time and it's not a waste because obviously they're great meetings but in terms of I could jump on a call with somebody I could jump on a zoom call or a skype call with somebody but I used to drive an hour and a half two hours into London have a meeting for an hour and drive back so that was five, six hours round trip, which I could have done in half an hour on the, on the phone. And it makes you a lot more productive. Um, but we're seeing within our work and moving forward, I, I now want to really incorporate technology in my, in my work. Um, in in the, on the, the work on stage, 
I'm now becoming really in, intrigued about trying to include digital elements into it because this whole digital age and the six months of um, technology advancement has been great for the industry, I think. Um, so I think that's a, a big positive for me personally. Yes, thank you. Any, yes, Mumba. Um, I think that this has been sort of said about um, using this as an opportunity for career development and finding out the areas in which you would like to really get like better at or finding the areas that you want to explore. Um, I was really lucky that in the beginning as well, like I spoke to um, Miranda Cromwell, I was like, oh, I really like this director. She's like, oh, I've assisted them. You can have a chat with them. And I Skyped the director who I would never have spoken to. Um, and so you suddenly become on like you create connections with people that you wouldn't normally have so I think that's been the silver lining is that you make connections with people you would yeah and you can do projects that you wouldn't have thought you would have done. Thank you uh Shami and then Rebecca after. I suppose just time to reflect as well like on our practice but on future work um I'm just read I say like I've read lots and things that I might have thought that it plays that I might have wanted to tackle at some point I'm like oh I'm actually not sure if I'm the person to tell this or if I'm the person to create this anymore or so I think it's time to reflect on our craft and look forward hopefully you know um and and of course I I've been back at home I just think it's the, the main silver lining for me was just having time at with my family which we never often never have you know so it was nice to uh put that to the core yeah just um uh the opportunities that have come in terms of learning so like there's so many programs that you can look at at the moment. So the Queen's Theatre Hornchurch um, runs something called Outer Limits, which if you're an uh, Outer East London or Essex based artist, um, and that's that's actors as well. I know actors often feel quite excluded from these conversations because you often, I and you also, um, often feel like you don't know what you have to bring to this conversation, but get involved um, don't kind of discount yourself from these conversations. So if you're, a, yeah, a, Outer East London and Essex based artists check out Outer Limits on the Queen's Theatre Hornchurch. Um, I know Derby Theatre in good company they do they've been doing so many workshops so it's a really good learning experience at the moment if there's other things that you've wanted to try it's it's a good time to learn this stuff and most of it's free um, and going off what everyone was saying about arts, arts council applications I have often considered myself as completely form phobic. I look at the length of forms and I just go, I can't deal with that and just run away and do something else. And um, there has never been more opportunity for you to get support from somebody who knows how they're doing with these things. And that support might not still be there once those people become busy doing other stuff. So even if right now you're like Arts Council funding, not my thing, just go on one of those Zooms, spend the hour and a half and just do it so that if if it ever does come back in the future that it is something that you want to do you know where to start and you're not needing to start from zero so and do tax return I'm doing my tax return I've got nothing else to do so just like sort sort out your stuff so you're ready to go when we can all get back together again properly and Sharon had a point as well I think that the silver lining for for me has been uh, the, the awareness of accessibility, that we can work remotely, that we can um, work around our family, so flexible working. I mean, I've, I've got a one-year-old and a four-year-old and they're both disabled and they've just been here all the time and I love them dearly, but the house gets very small when everybody's in it all the time. So I've, I've had to be working when they've been asleep and the... I think there's just a general acceptability that now we don't have to work nine to five. Um, we don't have to drive into London, as you're saying. We we can make it work flexibly. We can just Zoom Australia and somebody will answer. So yeah, let, let's keep that. Let's keep the accessibility. The fact if you do have mobility issues then we have zoom it's a perfect tool so that and the flexible working especially for parents 
then yeah, please let's keep that as an industry. That that would be a good silver lining to hold on to. Great. Thank you so much um, to our lovely panel. Um, it's been so interesting to hear your own individual sides of things and the kind of wider picture. Um, very inspiring. I think, you know, you've all shown us your resilience and your resourcefulness and hopefully given us thoughts and tips going into the future. Um, I love what somebody said about the level playing field, you know, that we're, the doors are open. We've got to remember that we can get to people we couldn't have got to before. There's accessibility. Um, and I think you've you've all given us hope, which is really important at these at this moment. Um, so from from MMD and MTN, um, a massive thank you to you all and uh, good luck with everything going forwards. And please, all of you on the panel and all of you watching, please keep in touch. Come to us with questions, particularly around funding things, but career development, possibilities, ideas, uh, we're here for you. Um, and have a lovely rest of your Monday evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>